Gary, yeah. thanks, for, and you too, thanks Evan. for meeting me. Fun day, isn't it? <laughs> Brilliant. My favourite, one of my favourite, I wouldn't say my favourite place because all my favourite places are in Donegal. <laughs> but uh, no, I love, I, 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 as you know, I lived in Salt Hill for four yeah. years. Uh, Back in uh, Valentine's Day 2005, I started in the Galway Bay. It was my, that was my first job. Yeah back in Ireland when I left Boston so uh, I had I had been I had been cooking in Galway as head chef next door at, a, at the young age of 19 while the Galway Bay was being built right. so the O'Sullivan family I would have probably been meeting them and different people that were associated with the hotel as yeah. it was being built literally from the ground up I, I kind of cycled past it back in the day when I couldn't afford a car I used to cycle <laughs> against the wind here coming coming up to to work every day so yeah when I came back when I came back from from Boston I, I'd live with this girl from Birmingham who was best friends with Dan Murphy's wife okay. and they just mentioned to me that Dan would want to have a wee chat with me about working there so I kind of predominantly looked after the restaurant when I went in there but had a had a brilliant few years working for for the O'Sullivan family in there and uh and look as I've said before I think you need to have big banqueting hotels high volume you know all these from from functions to weddings to you know big events you need to have it in your locker yeah. so that when you do get to an age where it's not just about feeding 10 people or 20 people and fine dining or whatever like you need to know how to run businesses and yeah, hotels okay. teach you that yeah you know so it yeah. was a good environment for me to be in we'll fast forward a little bit because we could talk all day about yeah. that. i'm sure you have loads of stories that, yeah. that, that you were telling me off off camera that are good crack uh but like uh so your kind of big break came when you you became head chef in Dumont house like how was that whole experience well when i left when i left boston that time in 05 yeah i'd looked at Viewmount house but the Georgian Mansion House wasn't connected to the stables. Yeah. And the minute I drove up the, the driveway into Viewmount, yeah. my heart kind of sank, because I thought, God, for a property like this, yeah. we need to have a, a, a formal meet and greet area where people are going to read the menus, Pe women are going to be coming in all dressed up, men are going to be all dressed up, everyone's going to be looking well. Yeah. You want, you'd, even though it's slight, the one thing that Tom Devlin in Boston taught me, yeah. and we can talk about this again in yeah. a bit, well, there's so so much more to running a restaurant than just the food. Okay. There, there's there's so many things have to be right. Okay. And 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 that was the big sticking point for me, was um. Just that twenty yards from the house to the restaurant. Yeah. yeah. So from two thousand and five to two thousand and eight. Yeah. James built six suites and connected the house to right. the restaurant. Okay. They got in touch with me then. It was just a a bit of a, fateful stroke of luck whatever yeah, you want to call yeah, it we yeah. got back in touch with one another so I went out and I started sourcing producers in the Midlands I did a favour for the O'Sullivan family who I knew yeah. they had a problem for the month of July in okay. the Hudson Bay yeah. in Athlone right. so I lived there for a month okay. ran their business for a month as a more of a favour than anything no, else no, here we, here we. Uh, and uh, and then Met a load of chefs. I opened I opened it with a friend of mine who was my pastry chef in the old post. Yeah. She came for a month. She stayed eight years. Wow. Okay. Um, Daniel came for a couple of weeks. He stayed nine years. Okay. And I ended up just having incredible consistency that way. Yeah. But but the, the the biggest break the biggest break in Viewmount House was the the biggest. Oh, if you just have us at the back there. Yeah. If you, you no, if you come around here and then we'll take off again. Yeah. Sorry, go on, Gary. Right. But the biggest break for me in, yeah. in Viewmount House was James and Beryl. Okay. And just them letting me do what I, what I wanted to do. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it was a case of, look, make money. It's a business and, and, and we'll push it on. But, you know, I lived in the place, yeah. you know, like, yeah. and, but it was the first time that I'd come across somebody since I'd come back to Ireland. And they were going to let me. They were going to let me run it. But I, I treat a business like I own it. It doesn't matter where I've ever worked. I treat it like I own it. Yeah. And I did that with them. They were good to me. I was more than good to them. Yeah. And the relationship was fantastic. You said uh, when you were in Boston, uh, the one thing you learned in Boston, or one of the things, was that the restaurants are so much more than the food. What, what like what? 
What are they? What, what else is? Well, I'll tell you what, right? I mean, Tom Devlin was my mentor and boss over there, right? I was his head chef, and I was a young head chef, 21, up in his first place. They have 10 now. I would have been probably involved in the first yeah. four, okay? Yeah. Yeah. But Tom, Tom's name was above the door. My first one, Devlin's, and that's still the that's still the daddy. Like that's the okay. one that probably means the most yeah. to them. But I always remember this one brunch. Next thing I was like going, geez, you know, it's, it's a bit it's a bit quiet or it's a bit this or it's a bit that or the other, you know, and next thing Tom comes bursting in, in, in from the back door, the boss man. And like, you know, I, 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 you'll have to edit it out, like what what he said to me, but he, he, he Tom went off on one, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, so we rolled out and he was like, what the fuck's going on? Like, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I was like, what are you talking about? So I'd been in at about six o'clock that morning. There was a dump of snow, yeah. right? Yeah. And... We went out, nobody could get into the restaurant. Yeah. L literally, like, from opening the doors at half eight, quarter to nine, whatever it was, yeah. there was this fucking mad dump of snow. Yeah. The foot pan, you know when it snows in the States, it snows in the yeah, States, yeah. right? So Tom went off and one, and anyway, came out. I went out and shoveled out, shoveled the driveway, the doorway, and the footpath. There's a wee bit of a footpath and salted it, did whatever. Yeah. Then that night, then he was he's like me, he's a fucking thick patty, redhead, and <laughs> calmed down, and I met him then. I went and did brunch and came back that night and uh we ended up you know i was chatting him in the bar and he says look gary he says it's just there's just so much more to it you know yeah. and he, we had a real real frank chat with me that night and he said listen you need to walk everyone he says like i'm on to you all the time he goes like you're in the car with me or we're here whatever we ring we opened we used to have this thing where we always rang the restaurant to see how the hostess answered the phone really? yeah yeah we okay. and i used to ring the restaurant every day days off it didn't matter yeah my thing for like the first year was i always had to go in on a night off okay. to have dinner or go in for a lunch go in yeah, for I a need. dinner see what it's you're like eat i always that's another thing that i carried into viewmount i ate in viewmount once every few months with with james okay once once we got a few years and got the chefs trained. I always eat in my own restaurants. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. You have to eat. You have to. You have to feel it like a customer. Yeah. So he said to me that night, if they can't get in, they can't spend fucking money. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's got to be good. The music's got to be right. The lights have got to be right. I mean, you ask any waitress or chef that's working me in Viewmount, and they will tell you like this fucker is relentless. Yeah. The food should be. It should just be such a given that the food's good. Yeah. Okay. But for a restaurant. Listen, I pride myself on the fact that there's probably, it's not even a probably, it's a, it's a definitely. There are many, many better chefs than me in Ireland. Okay. Way more. Right. You know what I mean? Um, and I'd look at them and say, you know, you could say maybe technically, listen, everybody can be technically brilliant on a plate. Yeah. But where I would really have always prided myself and be very proud of is I know how to run restaurants. Okay. I know... Yeah. The, the big thing is you can go to places and I've gone to restaurants with, with chefs and they're, they're fantastic. It's a fucking shit room. Yeah. It's a poor environment. It's all about what's on their plate or whatever. But you yeah. know what? There's nothing enjoyable about the, about what yeah, I'm yeah. sitting in. Okay. I hate that. Yeah. And like, and like going like, and I gotta be honest with you, I'm not enjoying that meal. If I'm sitting in a room that's sparse, too bright, staff are staring at me, they're walking around, it's too overly formal. That's a shit experience. Yeah. You know, you it, it doesn't happen in, in, in my dining rooms. I, I'd really, really like to think that, whether it be lunch or dinner, especially all those years in Viewmount or anywhere I've been from the Galway Bay to the Raza Pena to Devlin's to the Old Post, is that matters. The whole meal experience is everything. And yeah. all those little things add up through that, ex through that experience of, of going in, meeting and greeting, getting a drink, that, that what's on the plate should be a given now it's not always the case but for yeah. me in my world it's a given that that's going to be good yeah. now has everybody else been good around that yeah, yeah. because you know if the waiter if the waiter is acting the maggot or the front of the house isn't right and the lights aren't right or whatever it doesn't matter how good that food is yeah. you've had a bad night i'm telling you you've had a bad experience right that's not good enough yeah. it's just it just can't be tolerated you know um I read a great, uh, great uh, line from something you, you wrote a few years ago from McKenna's Guide, and it was that uh, uh, a cook becomes a chef, uh, a chef when, he, when he makes money. I'm oh, sorry, no, I got the fuck, I fucked that up. Yeah. Listen, if, if, you're not, if you're not making money for your bosses or for yourself, I mean, you can, you, listen, I manage 
a massive company right now, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I'm working one now, and, I've, and all my, and for what, since 19, I suppose, and in, in most ways I've been a head chef and doing whatever, but like everybody can, everybody that can cook, yeah. in essence, should be able to turn their hands to a Michelin level dish. Okay. It's not that hard. Okay. Well, when you're just cooking for like yeah. yourself or you're doing whatever, I mean, yeah. at any given time, most chefs can pull out a Michelin star dish. Now, can you do it in a restaurant environment when you're yeah. doing whatever? Then the other side of it is, is the minute you let your ego get in the way yeah. of, of the business, the business is fucked. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's, 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 there's no two ways about right. it. Like, if you're not making money, it's it's just ego, egotistical yeah. cooking. Yeah. It's pointless. Yeah. As, as far as running restaurants and doing whatever, like, it's an expensive thing to run yeah. as a restaurant. Yeah. From, from rates to power to ingredients to labor. And, you know, when you're writing menus as well, it's you, you got to be smart enough that... You're not writing a menu for a Monday evening in November. Yeah. You gotta be writing it for a full restaurant at 8.30, 8.45 on a Saturday night. Yeah. Can the team cope? Can we do it at the same level, at the same standard, without without blinking an eye, as we do on the Monday night or the Wednesday night or whatever? And that's where a smart chef manager comes into, into play then. There's no point in being this genius chef yeah. If your doors are closed after six months, yeah, there's course, no, yeah. you know, it's, you've got to keep the doors open. Like you've got to give people what they want. You've got to cook to the best of your abilities. But the minute you let your ego get in front of the business, then you're just like every other fucking washed up chef yeah. that stereotypically yeah. can't run a business. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that just doesn't wash. Yeah. Like if you want to, when you get older and you, and, and you do end up, if you end up having children or family or more responsibilities than just yourself, Evan, yeah. you, you, you've, you've got to know that you can run a business. Like you got to know, like if I went into the Galway Bay today, I could run it when my fucking eyes closed. I know I could because yeah. I've done it before. Or you go into a high-end restaurant and a fine dining restaurant. I've done that before. Yeah. Go into corporate hospitality and and run millions and millions and millions of euros worth of businesses maybe 90 plus businesses spread over the whole country doing that too and done that too yeah. but you got to be really methodical about how you do it how, how you look at it how you educate how you influence and then how you how you actually pull the trigger and deliver yeah so uh Go back to Viewmount. Uh, like you won everything that is to win in Viewmount, right? You, Apart you have, from a star. <laughs> uh, okay, you have everything on your mantle seat except yeah. for the lovely, the, the one that we all want, right? Yeah. The, the Michelin star. Yeah. Like, wh what do you think about that? I don't know, it just wasn't good enough. It's very okay. simple. Like, I mean, you could put it in layman's terms. We got looked at an awful lot, but 2013 was the year. 2013, like there was a few inspections that year. And I have to say, like that's not something that we woke up every day i mean every chef will tell you that's what you're after but that look we weren't i'm not going to say a price point because mitzen's not about a price point either i will be very very honest though and people might frown or do whatever but people that would frown might have been people that maybe never ate in viewmount house or never came to viewmount house but yeah. i could categorically tell you now it was incredible but in particular i had the same team for years but 2013 you know, I sat with a Michelin inspector for over an hour, nearly an hour and a half, on the on the 13th of March. He ate on the 12th of March, 2013. Yeah. I got married on the 18th of March. I'll right. never forget that week to the day I die. But I had about an hour and a half with the guy, and again later on in that year. But but that 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 would have been the only year in my heart of hearts where I thought, Jesus, you know, there's a chance, yeah. you know. But look. It's, it's not something that we woke up every day and we were thinking about. We woke up every day, like, make this restaurant one of the best in Ireland. I mean, okay. look, you know, we, we won restaurant of the year with, with Georgina Campbell, which was unbelievable. We won lunch of the year. That changed. Like, that, that Georgina Campbell award changed everything for us on lunch. I mean, we were doing 70 and 80 people every week. We, you know, we were full at that or whatever. Then we yeah. had a second dining room. But... Apart from all Ireland football final day and all Ireland hurling final day, and yeah. even at that, there's still a hundred. We were full every single week for the ten years I was there. It was un it was unbelievable. I mean, it was incredibly wow. successful. You know, yeah. um, the lunch in particular, weekends. I can never remember it ever being 
anything other than full, uh, so especially Saturday. I mean, the sad thing here is that you, if you could get everybody that wants to eat on a Saturday night to eat during the week, you'd be yeah. full every night of the week, you know what I mean? Right. But look, the, the Michelin star was neither here nor there. Like, we were in the guide in the house. They spoke very favorably in the guide itself. Any chef that tells you they don't want a Michelin star is a fucking liar. You know what I mean? And I'm no different. But that I'd be very, very honest about it. Like, we were not a Michelin star restaurant, but in 2013 we were, in my mind. We got there that year and then maintained that. But, like, that standard's getting higher and higher all the time, you know? I mean, then the, 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 the kitchen team then went through... Like there was one or two boys moved on and we promoted kitchen porters and I was always about bringing up what was in the kitchen, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So that does dilute you slightly then for, for another year or so, it's, yeah. it's harder. I mean, if you get it, you can maintain it, but if you don't have it, it's hard to get yeah. right back up on it, you know? So uh, you spoke, a, which I'm madly interested, which is the business side of restaurants, right? And you spoke about how you know how to make money, right? I wonder, the obvious, a thing that comes into my head is if you know how to make money and you know how to run successful restaurants why don't you have your own restaurant <laughs> hey do you know what hey that's that's the best question anyone's <laughs> ever asked me but it's also a question that nobody's asked me on camera before but they do ask me all the time um probably probably for the first time ever it's come into my head a little bit. Really? Yeah. Okay. Only in the last right. maybe six months. Yeah. I've, I've made money for others for years and years and years on end. I've just, I think when you really, really know what it takes, I, I pride myself on being a really loyal employee. Okay. I pride myself on, on busting my balls, treating it like I own it. But sadly, those those types of employees are very few and far between yeah. so and it, and it's not to put me on any type of a pedestal that's just a fucking fact like that if i if i knew tomorrow i could have a head chef or a sous chef that committed themselves to my restaurant like i committed myself to view my house i'd open a fucking restaurant tomorrow morning those chefs aren't there yeah okay. like you know, I had an opportunity to invest and go into a place in Boston many years ago as well. And Tom and, and, and my old pals from Boston have stopped opening restaurants because there's now not enough good staff to run them. The money's there to open them. Right, okay. I've had enough people ring me with money for years and years and years. I've had no shortage of backers. Like okay. when you get to the point where you're looked upon as successful and you've ran businesses for years, yeah. like money's if you really want it you'll i'll find it you know what i mean yeah. like or use my own okay. to open it yeah. my my big worry is 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 that added stress of the more you know <laughs> sometimes it actually turns you off doing it because yeah. you're just like i think i can't do anything unless i try to do it really really well and that takes a skilled workforce yeah we all know and look it's a brilliant environment i'm always the one that's on pushing this job pushing the career in the hospitality world it's amazing but it is fucking hard and it is tough yeah. and and it's not about the youth of today there's just so many more avenues for kids to make money nowadays why would they bother their arse going into kitchens for 15 hours a day or 18 hours a day and even the kitchens that you don't have to do that anymore and it's an eight hour day or a ten hour day yeah. it's a very very hard way of making money and making a living yeah. and it's just that little bit of fear that I had about going into it. Um, I think I've got over the, the egotistical years. I think I've yeah. earned a reputation. Okay. I think where I am now and the reason that it's even in my mind that yeah. I would do it is I've got fuck all to prove to anybody. Yeah, okay. So okay. I think you got to get to a, a point in life where, where you have worked for other people. You have worked at a high level. You've proven you can do it from a hotel to the corporate world to the fine dining world. Yeah, yeah. That then you get to the stage if i want to open a wee daytime place or a cafe or yeah. a bistro or whatever i won't be judged yeah of course. because yeah. You, i'm like going i've already shown you that i can rock and roll and fucking dance with the best of them anyway yeah. and any and any one of those levels so i suppose w once maybe i just needed to get to the point where i was completely in order to secure my own abilities yeah. that i didn't give a fiddler's fuck right. what anybody else thought about okay, me yeah. to finally maybe be at a stage where I'd be at peace with whatever I'm cooking yeah, yeah, yeah. you know I mean the ultimate for me would be like I live in Granard and Longford and I love it like whether it be a pub I would love to run a pub 
yeah. but good food. Okay. Really good stuff that I like to eat. But yeah. I've all, I've only ever cooked stuff I really like to eat anyway, which is, yeah, yeah. you know, it's never been about, you know, buttermilk and fucking yogurt and seaweed yeah. on a plate for no reason. You yeah, know what I mean? Like, I want to yeah. cook food that people are going to enjoy and eat. And I suppose I might just be, you might have just got me at a good time where I'm, I'm quite close to pulling a trigger on that end of things maybe. Do you want to yeah. give us a little exclusive or? No, no, no. All right, okay, that's fair <laughs> enough. But answer this one for me then. Just say hypothetically you're going to open up a restaurant that that would make money, right? That what? That would make money. Yeah. Be a successful restaurant. Like what, what type, bar, what are the types of restaurants do you think would make money in Ireland? Maybe where, like where would they be located or? Hey, as Ramsey famously said, location, location, yeah. location. Okay. And he's right. Yeah. It's like, you. one thing I will say is Car parking spaces are a big help. I've seen shitholes yeah, busy okay. because people can just drive up and park a car at the door or beside them or whatever. But location is the big thing. The next one, and you, you, you could put it in line with location, is make it nice. If it's good, they come. Okay. I always said about Viewmount, every man and his dog said to me about going and opening a restaurant in Longford. Who goes to Longford? Nobody goes to Longford. Yeah. And I, honest to God, always said, listen, if Nevin can get them to Black Lion, <laughs> yeah. I can get them to Longford. Yeah. Everybody said to me 11 years ago in 2008, they said, you know, like nobody goes there or whatever. I was like going, yeah, but it's, it's literally in the middle of the country. Everybody yeah. passes it or everybody's around there. Yeah. How's it going? It is the best location in the country. Okay. And it was proven to be right. Oh, okay. That's how I looked at it. Yeah. Everybody looked at it from a negative point of view that, oh, there's no tourism there, it's not nice, whatever. But we ended up becoming that destination, you know? Yeah. And I always said, if it's good, people come. I don't care if it's a stew yeah. or the fanciest plate of food you've ever seen or a, a tasting menu. If it's affordable and it's nice, and by affordable, I mean if the price matches the quality. Yeah. I think regardless if you're selling a scone or a quesadilla or a black sole, yeah. if it's nice and it's good, you'll be busy. Okay, nice you know? one. There's, um, you were mentioning about uh, kind of the, the lack of quality staff nowadays. You know yourself, there's a huge chef shortage the last couple of years in this country and even outside of this country. Uh, I wonder, like, uh, do you have any, would you have any kind of inclinations as to why nobody wants to become a chef anymore or what's the problem? Well, I suppose, like, I, I, I hate seeing, like, that everybody always goes on about, like, you know, the abuse in the, in, in the environment and this, that, and the other. I mean, I've, I've only, I've worked in tough, tough restaurants, but they've all, people have always been treated really well. And I know I'd like to think I've treated everybody well and I've been treated well enough. But I've also experienced bullying myself on a personal level. Um, I won't get into that or the where's or the how, but so I, I have been at the other side of it and it, and, it, and it's and it's fucking awful, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and I'm not talking about when I was a kid either. Like I've, I've been around it wow. big time, but um, it's, I, I just think it's the fact that there really, there really are so many more avenues that you can that you can make money from now that people just look at the career and think it all looks wonderful and glamorous on the TV. Yeah. But you look at the Marcos of this world, and I work with Marco all the time, and you look at Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. Like they went through, going back to the previous point, they've gone through years and years and years of graft to get to a level. You know, I made my Saturday Kitchen debut yeah, last that. month, which yeah. was unbelievable. Yeah. I was on a show that had... Tom Carriage, Nigella Lawson, Matt Tebbett, Rick Steen, and Keith Floyd. It was the best day of my life. It's a big time. It was the best day of my life. Yeah. That was the one day where I felt, and that was that was 11 years after I made my TV debut. My first conversation with them was seven years ago. That was one of the best days of my life. And it wasn't just about being on TV. It was about the fact that I used to admire, I mean, still do Keith Floyd yeah. Tom Carriage incredible yeah. you're sharing a stage with people that I've literally grown up watching admiring and that was a, it was a really nice day for me because you know lately there hasn't been a million nice days like so that was a good one you know why they're not coming into the industry I don't know it's a brilliant industry it's given me an incredible life I've worked hard but people work hard in a lot of different careers it's it's absolutely it's it's an industry that I would literally shout from the heavens. You will work hard, but I'll tell you, if you want to rock and roll and enjoy life and travel the world, you can literally grab a bag. Yeah. You can go work in a tiki bar in the arse end of Mexico. No yeah. problem. 
you know what I mean you can jump in a plane to France you've done that you've gone in a plane and gone to London you can get in a car and go down to Cork you can go up to Donegal and shuck oysters for a year you can go to Boston and and or go to a beach in Maine and make lobster rolls for a yeah. summer you can do whatever you want to do because everybody wants to eat everybody wants to eat well it's the best job in the world it's tough but so is a lot of other careers yeah. it really is you know I wouldn't change mine for the world you know all right, well, that's the place to finish it, eh? Gary, yeah, no thanks bother. so much for being here. All right, buddy. Sound. All right, man. How's that? Boom. Uh, She's so juicy.